So, you guys have a little bit of color behind how I'm, you know, the process that we, that, that got me here. There's a quintessential New York story. People in New York, as the people in Las Vegas, as everyone here tonight, is very passionate about the markets and about the art of speculation. And so when I heard two individuals speculating about the markets, I just felt compelled to interact with them and, and see if, you know, something more fruitful couldn't develop, and, and, and that's in fact what happened. I think I want to start off by saying that I'm very impressed that given the sparse amount of good weather in Seattle, having lived here for five years and can appreciate that, <laughs> that on a summer Thursday night, we have a packed room here, all in the sense of developing and learning more and, and becoming better market practitioners. And so I commend you guys for that, and I commend your spirit and enthusiasm, and I want to provide you and make it worth your while and give you as much as I can about the perspective from which I trade the markets. So I'm going to start off... Um, talking a little about the book I have coming out, The Global Macro Wedge. Tonight's presentation, the topic of it is incorporating the macro narrative into, uh, into your trading. And given this is the MTA, which obviously focuses on the technical analysis aspect of the markets, having a macro narrative and, and understanding the regime aspects can really give you context. And I'm going to show you how I incorporated and really, over the last 10 years, brought the macro narrative and brought market sentiment and psychology into my trading and what it's done for my results. And so hopefully you guys can extrapolate something from that incorporating your results as well. A little bit about me. I am a high-velocity cross-asset class trader. High-velocity cross-asset cl class trader sounds much more dignified than saying I'm a day trader, okay? So that's, that's how I would approach it. I'm author of The Global Macro Edge, Maximizing Return Per Unit of Risk. All the profits of this book are going to go to pay for service dogs to go to returning veterans from Afghanistan, um, Iraq, and all those guys who, who obviously defend our country, and, uh, and for that I'm very passionate about that. As I point out here, I, I spent nine years in the Marine Corps. I'm um, Bob Pinnell, um, Marine Corps veteran as well, fought in the Vietnam War for this country, so let's give Bob a hand actually for being a veteran. I love foreign languages. I think that there's, much like the code of the market, there's something to be learned and deciphered from just being able to communicate another language and learn another way of thought. I, I lived in Japan for four years, served in the Marine Corps, U.S. Embassy, majored in Chinese, spent, spent um, two summers in China and in Beijing, in fact, the language institute there. Went to Brazil last year for the World Cup. My wife is Brazilian. We speak Portuguese at home all the time. And um, being that I lived in New York City for seven years, learned, learned to, to dance salsa and obviously the strong Latin influence growing up in California in the Bay Area, blah, blah, blah. Um, and most importantly, I'm a University of Washington alum. I love Seattle. It is, you guys, this city, this, this campus has an amazing ability to recruit people to come here. Factually, it is because this is Seattle, it is because of my experiences here, that when I was given the opportunity to come back here, this is why in the middle of Janet Yellen speaking, a CPI number, an ECB decision, a Greek crisis, I made a point that this is a great people, great city. I'm coming back to my alum and, and, and coming in from Las Vegas and, and going to be a part of this because I just know the spirit of the city and the passion you guys have for the markets. So thank you, and, and you are the reason that compels top speakers to come. It's not a mistake that that happens. Next slide. All right. Woo. That's, uh, that's my dog, Delta, just driving home the point of, uh, of, of, of Delta. Yes, for the, you, you get the joke, the double yeah. entendre of why I call my dog Delta. Three goals of the presentation. How to understand the macro narrative and its impact on price action. Two, to look at the market from a return per unit of risk perspective. Most people out there approach the market from a one-dimensional perspective, i.e., what was your return last year? When you finish reading my book, and hopefully in this presentation, you'll be able to ask, what was my return per unit of risk? And the process of assessing a return on a return per unit of risk basis is what this entire book covers and, and a little bit of what I'm going to delve into in this presentation. And it's a completely different perspective of, okay, how can we do that? And then introduce resources and processes which have worked for me to make that happen. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Wow. As cool as it is to like talk in esoteric terms like option terminology and technical analysis jargon, at the end of the day, I have found the stuff that works best for me are very simple, robust concepts that are aggregated into a more robust process. But at the core, they're very intuitive, they're very holistic, they're, they're at the heart of what, of what you're at. Okay. My history, and it's important to get a sense of genetically maybe why I'm wired the way I am, okay? I, in high school, was a liquidity provider 
for those wishing to prognosticate on the outcome of sporting events. I was a bookie, okay? And in the process of being a bookie, I learned a lot of key lessons. It was, it was all sorts of things like, you know, asymmetrical opportunities, counterparty risk. I learned about Lehman in high school when I had people betting on games and then didn't pay me. So I had to assess my counterparties, okay? Um, and one of the biggest things I learned, and the last point I make here, is the need to innovate. In high school, who in here has placed a bet on a, on, on, a, on a football game before with a point spread? Go Hawks in the Super Bowl, again, two years ago against Denver, getting plus three, total blowout, money line play was the best play. Living in Las Vegas, what I did, bet on sports, sorry. So the traditional point spread, when I was running my bookie operation in high school, was a very binary outcome, okay? If a team wins by X, if a team was a seven-point favorite, Seattle's playing Denver, they're a seven-point favorite in the game. Seattle wins by eight, they win by 28, you win the same amount of money, okay? If Seattle wins by six, you lose your entire amount. So this traditional point spread didn't truly reflect the results of what you had in the game. So I invented in high school the progressive point spread. And I modeled out for my clients what they would get paid based on the outcome of the game. So if their team was a seven point favorite and won by eight, they'd only win 20% of their wages. They'd still win, but only 20%. Conversely, if a team was a seven point favorite and won by six, they'd only lose 25% of their wager. Okay? I'm still making my big all right, as the bookie, but now I'm helping them dampen volatility. And that came as about of innovation. Well, yes. So the global macro edge and the way I approach the markets has a similar context. That there's a three-dimensionality to how we look at things, okay? So in the global macro edge, all right, there are six myths that we bust. Because I could have written another book on look at this crossover, follow this Fibonacci line, because those are things I look at in the context. But it's hard for people to truly grasp, in my opinion, as the reader, I should say, it's much easier for the reader to grasp if you can attach conventional wisdom and then bust that conventional wisdom, show why something is not, in fact, the case that most of us think. And the first thing, the first myth that we bust of the six is that more risk equals more return. And what we actually show is that more risk just equals more risk. It's smarter risk that equals more return. So we show methods and strategies which, which illustrate that. The second thing. Money will always find its most efficient home. How many times have we heard that? Well, money doesn't always find its most efficient home. I go into detail in that. The third thing, and possibly the most polarizing of the entire book, Denise Schultz contributes to this chapter. She wrote the book Market Mind Games. I highly recommend anyone to read Market Mind Games by Denise Schultz. She's a great lady. We've done some webinars together on CQG back in New York City. But emotions are your biggest enemy. In fact, we prove that emotions, intuition, feelings can be your biggest ally. Now, to the MTA, that may be a bit controversial because ultimately we like to believe that, that our emotions can be displayed or portrayed within the charts. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk briefly about some, some techniques that I've used that shows that there are emotional aspects, your intuition you have, that can be quantified, that may not necessarily be depicted on the charts, but can still be valuable for you in your trading and investment endeavors. The fourth thing that we look at, diversification is the, whole, is the only strategy you need. That's a huge myth that we bust. Diversification is forward-looking. There you go. The fifth thing, there was more opportunity in the past. No, that's not true either. The playing field's never been more level, everyone. It's never been more easier for Leslie to compete with a big Wall Street firm or for people of the MTA to have the same access and information or nearly the same access that people had. And it's really leveled the playing field, and it's incredibly opportunistic. And the last thing, which is a subject I presented on in Chicago last month, was that compensation should be based on returns. Actually, compensation should be based on returns per unit of risk. I'm not going to talk about that in too much detail today, but at any rate, next slide, please. So, myth number two, which is where this all comes in, all right, is that money always finds its most efficient home. And there are huge constraints which prevent money from going to the right places, whether it's institution, a manager needs to have a manager needs to have a 10-year track record, a five-year track record, 500 million in AUM, whatever the case may be. You can show up to an institutional allocator and say, look at my, my P&L for the last five years, okay? Oh, well, well um, how much does your strategy scale to? Or how does your da-da-da-da? So there's lots of legacy issues that prevent capital from finding its most efficient place. And that actually correlates to why there's certain market opportunities as a result of that. For us, who I imagine, like myself, trade my own capital, I'm not running a massive balance sheet. So, I, so we need to use that flexibility we have to our advantage. 
Let the guys that run a billion or two billion dollars deal with their liquidity problems. That's not our problem. That's their problem. So let's take that flexibility and use that to our advantage. And then uh, we see 401k limitations. And then when we talk about money finds the most efficient home, well, John Neto, prove it. Show me something substantial that you can prove to me that money doesn't find the most efficient home. Show me your returns. Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Next. This is my equity curve. $100,000, my personal futures account, January 2010. Made 3.2 million off of that in the last five and a half years. No bullshit. I got account statements here to show you. Um, started with $100,000, went through some rough times, real estate, 2008, lost a lot of money outside of the market, really hurt me liquidity wise. Other people, same situation. And had to make a lot of, had to do some deep soul searching that after, you know, eight years having the sort of success that I had, to take the kind of hit that I did on a personal side from a non-market related event and go through some other challenges and struggles, had to really recalibrate what I was doing. So what I'm saying is that I've been through some serious financial hits. I recovered from them. And anyone who has ever been through that can do the same thing for themselves. And that's what I'm here to show you. Not sell you anything, but just hopefully you can learn from my experiences. 2010, popped up $220,000 off that hundred grand. 2011, made 450 off of that. I'm still pulling money out to pay my bills and cover expenses and stuff. 2012, 700,000. 2013, cleared over a million in P&L. Off this original $100,000. 2014 was a tough year, 200K. And I'm half a million so far this year, off of just my own personal account, you know, right there. Next slide, please. So I said, all right, here's the account statement from 2000. It doesn't not show. Anyway, you see right here, this is, I maybe you can't. Anyway, that's 825000 made in 2000. It's kind of blurry. 12? Yeah, top right corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is the end of 2012. Made 705, lost 15,000 options. That netted out to 690. 2012, next slide, please. 2013. Popped in eight, ten in one account, and then had two fifty come in another account. So cleared over a million in 2013. Next statement. Like I said, made 200,000. 2014 was a really tough year, but still grinding some cash out of it is what it is. Next slide. So I said to myself, all right, I really don't want to be in a position where I'm always showing my account statements, but I kind of like this group. I'm like, what the fuck? Let's just be totally transparent, okay? <laughs> so has anyone here heard of collective2.com? Okay. Check it out, all right? It's a website that people go to. Say it again. Collective2.com, okay? It is a website that people can follow other strategies. It's a way that if you believe that you could be a great money manager, you can go there and as a third party, you enter your trades, can be done virtually, and people can follow you either for signals or they can auto trade your signals you send out there. I said, huh, this could be a really effective way to promote the book and promote that I in real time can go and like show people from a third party instead of them the hassle of them logging into my account to, to, again, transparency and credibility to what I'm doing. Because if you can't put up, put up or shut up, okay? You either got the P&O, you don't. Everything else is just excuses. So what this account did, I said, okay, come February 11th, I'll open an account for $250,000, virtual 250 k I'll mirror it along my same account as best I can. Honestly, the, the, the trade inputs are not as sophisticated as I'd like, but it is what it is. So the $250,000 opened up, have made 98,000 virtual in the last four, five months now. Started February 11th, so January, so July 11th. We're now at the five month mark, okay? Is it, is it like, are you doing virtual trading? Virtual trading, 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 right. Real money no, right no, now? I'm trading my real money, but on the side. Okay, so the, you're trading your real money here, but on there you're But on there it's all virtual, correct. you're trying to mimic what you're doing. Right, but I'm there. shadowing my account as best okay, I can on it. that. And then people can actually follow and, and auto trade this at interactive brokers at, E open e outcry at all these places they can auto trade this strategy so this is integrated so that people can actually trade real money behind this okay hmm. so but, but then a couple of other sites is doing the similar thing. right right like striker right uh, our world cup uh, right the world cup uh, robin. right robin's trading does yeah. similar stuff as well right trade station now does a similar yeah kind of stuff. right so this is becoming more prevalent in this era of the democratization of information okay in other words the ability to assess a manager based solely on their P&L, not what university they went to, not their last, did they work on at Goldman or whatever. It's, does this manager have a strategy to give value? So 
quarter million, up 98,000 system-wise. Next page. Here's what I said started, 7%, down 5, up 10, up 6. Here's the equity curve. The S&P is down here. This is up there. Next slide, please. Um, they have the trades on here. So again, this isn't showing up clearly, but you can see the timestamps on all the trades, the P&L from each trade that sets up over here along these lines. You know, it shows this amount and how I've worked it up. You know, two to three times a week a trade comes up that I see that I can actually, it makes sense for me to put on in this account. Okay, it's challenge. Like I can't maneuver as much in my own account where I've, the technology is on, but at least you get a sense for that this is real. You know, right now this is on pace to make 112 percent, um, something like that. Yeah, 78 percent with the fees because they charge a ridiculous round turn fee on here of like 16 dollars a round turn. Okay, so I'm gonna make 16 at 16 dollars a round turn. Going to make 78% this year at that pace. Without the round terms, it's like 112, 112%. Next slide. Um, to give you a sense of how good this is, there are 14,000 strategies on Collective 2 right now. Okay, There are 4,000, I believe, that are active. If you run a search for a Sharp above 2, a Calmar, a Sharp above 2, a Sortino above 3, a Calmar above 5, and up 1% in the last 90 days, 1%, 5, 5 of the 4,000 qualify. Protean, me, is one of those five. I think I've driven home my point home. Next slide, please. <laughs> so, the netto number. When I talk about looking at something from a return period risk basis, and I presented last month in Chicago, I came up with a netto number originally for many reasons, but the first purpose is that how do you measure a market? How do you measure a stock or a strategy that's maximizing return period of risk, okay? And for me, there's a couple of factors that go into that, all right? And then I'm going to take this and incorporate it into how I look at this juxtaposed to the macro narrative. So just so you understand the logic of where I'm taking you guys on this, because it's been a lot of chest pounding so far. I don't mean to be that. I'm just trying to set the stage of, of what I do to make this happen. So there's a couple of factors that when I look at, uh, at how something maximizes the of risk, the first is max negative drawdown. How much heat are you putting me under? Okay, it's not max drawdown, but max negative drawdown. By that I mean, if I give you $100,000 and you lose 10,000 of that 100,000, that's max negative drawdown. I give you 100,000, you run up to 130, and you lose 10. I don't, I don't mind that, because you lost money from profits versus losing money from my principal. My principal's my money. <laughs> my profits, well, you know, I can't, I can't cry because I made it that way. I can't cry if I lose it that way too. You know. So, and then the second factor is, and this is where there is such a big mistake out there. Like I said, there are three dimensions of return assessment. And when you can put all three dimensions on how you assess the market, I believe that all of your technical systems will become much more robust. Okay, the first dimension is, what was my return? Okay, how much did you make? Well, the Dow's up 100 points today. The S&P's up 50, or the Dow's up 100, S&P's going to be up 8 or 9, all right? The Nasdaq's up 12, okay. That doesn't really tell me a whole lot. The second dimension, which is very common amongst institutions out there, is looking at things from a risk-adjusted basis. Well, okay, the S&P made, you know, 8% this year, but what was the sharp on the S&P? And by the sharp, I mean, what was the return incorporating the volatility on that as well, all right? What was the CalMar, meaning like, what was the three-year, the CalMar is a, officially a three-year return divided by the max drawdown over that. So if a, you have a, invested for three years and the guy makes you 100,000 and loses you 35, he has a CalMar of a little close to three. Okay, so it's just simply return over max drawdown, very simple to follow. And that, that I call second dimension risk management. Okay, and, and the entire financial industry, or nearly the entire financial industry, is caught in that 2D risk perspective. But the 3D risk perspective, and this is what the netto number does, okay? And this, I believe, is going to change the way that we assess alpha and then how we compensate for alpha, all right? The third dimension is, what was the implied risk of that investment? It's great that you can tell me a sharp ratio that a market was up 100,000 with a max run of 30,000. But what I need to know to measure true manager skill and to measure how a market is really performing is what was the implied risk in that trade? How much was the manager risking? So for an example, that unit of risk. I give Bob here a million dollar investment. I tell him, if you lose $100,000 of that, I'm going to take your, your money away. 
I'm giving you a million dollar balance sheet, but 100,000 of that, if you lose 100,000 of your budget, if you will, I'm taking that away. I give Leslie a million dollars as well, but I'm going to give her a $300,000 risk budget. So at the end of the year, Bob makes 200,000, Leslie makes 200,000. But Bob made 200,000 with only a $100,000 budget. Leslie made 200,000 with a $300,000 budget. Who actually did a better job of maximizing return period of risk in that case? Bob did. Because the 100,000 risk budget. But there's no institutional metric that accounts for the implied risk in that deal. So what the netto number does is the third dimension that incorporates a perceived risk level to assess who's maximized return period of risk at the best level. It's three-dimensional perspective. And so we're going to take that three-dimensional perspective and apply that to the markets. Now, this is just like an offshoot, but when I present in Chicago, you actually take the netto number, and that tells you what incentive structure a person earns. So just sort of giving you a quick snippet of that, if you have a netto number of 0.5, you're actually only entitled to a 10% incentive fee. Most hedge funds work on a 1 in 20 or potentially 2 in 20 structure, so the netto number is going to actually be the basis from which compensation will be going forward. This has already been adopted by an introducing broker in Chicago that has 1,000 clients. Another um, commodity fund that runs 100 million is going to use the netto number compensation structure to, to pay their managers and compensate their managers. And now, you can now use the netto number to assess markets as well. Okay, next slide. This is my netto number dashboard. Okay. And what I do is I come into the market every day and before I look at the macro narrative, this is just meant to give you guys a, a concept of what's on John Nettles' desktop, okay? There are multi-billion dollar funds that don't have stuff that's this robust. This is some powerful, powerful, powerful stuff here that, like, tells you a story without having to watch CNBC, without having to watch Bloomberg, which I, I mean, if I'm on, you should watch, okay? But, like, in other words... <laughs> but really gives you a quick assessment. And so what this does is, I can immediately do a snapshot and find out who's maximized return period of risk, the best and the worst on the trading day. So this is from Monday, as I'm grabbing screenshots before I come in, okay? And I see on the worst side, the, the bottom five, I see the VIX market, I see Euro British pound, I see European fixed income, I see um, RBOB crude at the bottom. I see the top, I see the Q's at the top, I see Amazon at the top, and I say, okay, the VIX, the VIX is in the bottom five on a risk-adjusted basis. Huh. Amazon's at the top, and QQQ's at the top on a, in terms of their, the highest netto number. Huh. Huh. What's going on right now? Well, European equities, where's my DSX? That should have been higher in that point in time. Probably the longer term it is, DSX. Yep, there it is. So I, I chart both them on a one-day basis and a five-day basis. The DSX and the Dow Jones Euro stocks, okay? Just intuitively, that should have been, I just knew from the price action, that should have been captured right there. So that's what we had Monday. A major repricing in European equity volatility, okay? Given the, the, the resolution on Sunday night, they come in Monday. We get a repricing on the VIX, which is the volatility index in Europe. That, that unwind forces a bid in European equities, that unwind in the, in the European VIX is going to do what to the U.S. VIX? Smash it down as well, from the relative values that go across to both of those markets. So now, I, John Netto, ho-hum, freaking four in the morning on the West Coast, all right. <laughs> oh, the VIX. The VIX is in my bottom five. What else is going on? Oh, my goodness. Huh. All right. We got some cool stuff going on here. The top of my equity leaderboard, Amazon, QQQ, Walmart. Okay, boom, 145 Netto number. Damn. Rock and roll. So those are the markets now I'm focused on, the top and the bottom. And now I incorporate the macro narrative and what this is, this is a bullshit meter on if the news is right or not. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Next slide. So just breaking this down more. And I don't apply just on markets, but on synthetics as well, because I trade, I'm a, I do a lot of relative, I have all sorts of strategies I apply. Relative value, vol crush, um, you know, directional, sentiment fades, high velocity, economic numbers, Fed results, all that stuff. And I'm constantly assessing where the market's at in this process. So, okay, I'm looking at corn spreads, you know. And, and, and again, if one of these guys has the gumption to score a higher low netto number, it tells me, like, gold price in, in, in pounds here. You know what this tells me? Carney, the head of the Bank of England the other day, came out with a statement, all right? That statement by Carney 
and the strong dollar on top of that, what's that cause? Gold commodities are weaker, which is a re-emerging re theme from earlier in this year. Now the Greece deal is done. Okay. Strong dollar against the euro. Strong European equities. Compressed volatility regime. All of this stuff, if you're going to run your technical systems, you better have a regime context in what you're trading. Because if you get a moving average crossover or one of your systems that signals a buy, and you have the VIX sitting at the bottom of my dashboard, you better seriously reevaluate you know, that system. And you take even mediocre, mediocre trading systems, and you put them in the right regime, and it just robusts them up significantly. But you've got to understand the macro narrative. Okay? You need to have that fundamental context. I'm going to show you how I do that. Next slide. So anybody here use Bloomberg? I'm on Bloomberg. It's a, it's a freaking blessing and a curse. I mean, they, they charge too much money, but you can't live without it. It's like, um, the Fed speech is right here, okay? It's about being able to spend time in advance and think, okay, these are the events coming up. Today was, you know, ECB press conference. We had, you know, Yellen delivers testimony to the Senate banking panel. All right, that was a replay from yesterday, so that wasn't really an, an issue at all. Fisher speaks about challenges in Washington to see if he drops a dime on the market. SF you know, President um, Williams speaks. You guys got to know when these speakers come out. Understand the context. Understand where we are technically relative to what they're about to say. Are they a hawk? Are they a dove? Are they neutral? What are they known for in the, in the markets? Like, this takes time and pricing. And yes, it requires work, but as I've shown you from my own personal P&L, it can pay substantial dividends and give you that edge over just pure quantitative automated systems out there, which is why I think most quant systems if they go through enough regimes, can't run into a lot of problems. But if you have the macro narrative behind you to contextualize that, and yes, it's not perfect, yes, now that means you have to rely on your own trading psychology, but it's something that can be done, you can improve on incrementally. I'm not saying abandon everything you're doing, but I'm saying I would highly encourage you guys to at least at a small incremental level incorporate more of the macro narrative behind what you do. Next slide. You know, again, just looking at some of this, some of the stuff here. This is from this is from Thursday. Next slide. Okay, so here's a little bit. Um, this is one of my my dashboards on Bloomberg. I watch a lot of the fixed income curve pretty intimately, not just ours, but I want to know where like the euro dollar strips or euro dollar packs are at, what they're pricing in, what other, you know, what the gilts are trading at, what the boom bobble shots is trading at. Those markets, because as we've seen, a lot of the TLT movement has been predicated upon the boom bobble shots. Okay, what's happening in Europe right now? How are those things coming out? Is, is, and in fact, a lot of the price movement we've seen has not even been during U.S. trading hours. China drops a headline bomb. Greece drops a headline bomb. Whatever the case may be. The 2010s. Okay, this is one of my big themes. Okay, to, to the next party you're at, like, drop this, drop this little verb. Because I'll be like, oh, you're so right. The 2010s <laughs> will be known as the decade of data. Those who can aggregate organize and assimilate that data will be the winners. And I'm not talking just the markets, okay? But we have never had more availability to structured and unstructured data. And ultimately, I think the market is a big information game that's like a huge Jedi mind trick, right? And so, and so, and so how now can I find someone or find something that's aggregating this unstructured data. And let me define what I mean by that. By structured data, I mean economic numbers, you know, um, retail sales, earnings, unstructured data, what people are saying on social media, how they're feeling about the Giants winning the Super Bowl. I'm just going to go buy a, buy a new bench at Walmart from my backyard, you know. <laughs> I'm feeling happy, okay. That's much trickier. But... Ultimately, if you want to understand market sentiment and ultimately how certain asymmetrical risk-reward opportunities are created, you must understand the influence of market positioning and market sentiment. That's done much better by aggregating unstructured data, which of course is much harder than structured data, but ultimately that's why you need to have a source to do that. Next slide. Bring in rearview macro. I don't read a whole lot of stuff because with an error number dashboard, you don't have to, but one thing I do read is rearview macro. And what Neil Azus does he is a UW alum, University of Washington, out in Stanford, Connecticut. He has some seriously huge clients. And he has a newsletter that literally he charged $100,000 a year for that now is less than $9 a day. 
It is the most cutting edge, on point, macro insight newsletter. And I can tell you that I almost never get blindsided by a story that never even makes it on CNBC or Bloomberg of what's driving major institutional flow. And so when I look at unstructured data, how Neil reports, first of all, starts with a risk adjusted return monitor. Does this kind of look familiar, guys? Yeah. He has his own netto number dashboard for himself. Okay? And so what I'm going to do with emails, I'll send all of you guys, and for those that don't want it, let me know or whatever, or let them know. But a two-week trial to that, there's no credit card, it'll just stop, but at least let you guys know just what you're not even reading right now. Okay? You'll be like, holy cow. The last two days alone, next slide, please. Neil, and he has a model portfolio. I'm a guy who likes accountability. I don't like someone just talking stuff and not showing. So model portfolio, he runs it on a model $300 million portfolio. Last year was $100 million. He made 19% with a sharp, I think, of like two and a half. He had a 3% max drawdown. Like legitimate, and, and I'm not talking on like the John Netto trades where you're in and you're out three hours later, okay? I mean like hardcore macro theme calls that like break down. He put on like a conversion trade on Apple, okay, where he like was long the underline, sold a call, sold a put, walked him through their like reverse Swiss rank trade and how that went out. The guy's absolutely brilliant. Go Huskies, okay? <laughs> Next. And, and so then he has a trade lab where then he breaks down all that. So like, you talk about learning as you go, all right? There are master's courses, PhD courses in this country that don't offer this, that don't offer this. Next. So I want to kind of bring this home, okay, by talking about tomorrow's trade. Because I've done a lot of, it's easy for me to show you, oh, look at what I did and look at how I do this. And here's this dashboard right here. But let me get into what I see setting up tomorrow and just an example of how I'm going to approach tomorrow's trading day, okay? Tomorrow we have a very big CPI number. I've gone over a few things that have happened this week. Stronger dollar, weaker commodities, stronger European equities, weaker U.S. equities, not the NASDAQ now because we had good come out and just smashed earnings. So we'll see some beta migration tomorrow, at least on the, on the NASDAQ and some growth stocks in that regard. Um, but we have a CPI figure coming out tomorrow. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with all the nuances of this, there's a component in the CPI called the OER, or the Owner Equivalent Rents, okay? And that measures the prices of rents around the country, and it tends to be regarded as a much stickier aspect. It makes up 33, 34% of the overall CPI. And the OER tomorrow, I think, will be a very, very, very big factor. It's been running at 3.5%. Now, the one part of the Fed's mandate, as we all, or most of you are probably familiar with, is that inflation is not reaching its targets, okay? That's the one part, if you look at their core PCE projections, and the summary of economic projections, which they put out every quarter. If you were not familiar with the Fed and what all of us nerds watch and stuff and try and like, oh, what are their projections? Their, their perpetually wrong projections <laughs> um, <laughs> is, is, you know, the core PCE is one where, you know, they're rocking at 1.2 right now, okay? Now, the one thing that would sort of undo that is if we begin to get some of the stickier, and by stickier I mean that, there's some inflation that's transitory, which is why they measure CPI based on CPI headline and CPI X food and energy. They regard the food and energy as more transitory factors within that CPI number. And so the OER is part of the core CPI, and it's very, very sticky. And as you guys know from living in Seattle, what have rent prices and home prices done in Seattle? Okay. Vacancy rates are near their lowest levels right now in, in many, 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 many years. Okay. So we have, fixed, we have the resolution of Greece. We have European volatility, which is being compressed. Okay? We have commodities heading down, despite the poor retail sales number, okay? and despite um, you know, some other data, the non-farm payrolls number we just got, people are kind of re-emerging these themes again. What was the theme coming in the year? Long dollar versus the euro from the end of 2014 into 2015. Weaker commodities. Long European equities, those themes after the resolution of Greece are now playing themselves out again, which is why knowing the macro narrative is so critical. Okay, so tomorrow, fixed income's vulnerable. If we get a hot CPI number, I think there's a, what I call an asymmetrical risk that we get a more definitive follow-through in gold. All of Europe knows that deal with Greece was bad, which is why the euro's been selling down since that resolution, okay? But now we get a hot CPI number tomorrow, and I think there's opportunity. So I'm betting that other billion dollar managers out there, not that I'm one of them, 
but are going to be afraid of a hot CPI number. So there'll be a trade tonight, before the number, and after the number. And I'm betting that fixed income, the euro, and probably the yen are probably all going to bleed a little bit lower on a concern that because of the hot PPI that we had a few days ago, which, by the way, there's very little statistical significance between a PPI and a CPI, but most people don't know that. It's like, oh, my God, well, the PPI was hot. Well, actually, there's very few things that actually translate between one and the other, but I'll let... That's another myth I'm just going to let perpetuate a little bit longer before we try and adjust that, that mindset. So now we're reasserting these themes, and there's a chance for you guys to, at least I'm going to try. Again, I'm training at the University Inn right now, you know, in the process of being up here <laughs> um, on their Wi-Fi. That's, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and so I'm going to go ahead and, and look to potentially play that move lower. And if this number comes to headline point four, and we get... Now, there's subcomponents of the CPI as well. You'll hear them maybe talk about it on CNBC, maybe not. Um, they, because the CPI is intense, it can be very misleading. So there's a subcomponent called the NSA CPI index, NSA core CPI index. So the NSA core CPI index, if that comes in hot, that's actually situated. The core CPI right now is set for a 0.2, but the NSA, because it can be in one tenth, like, I'm going to ask you guys a question here, all right? And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to get a little esoteric, and I apologize. So I'm going to bring it back. Bring it back, Nando. Bring it back. <laughs> There's a bit of a flaw in the Commerce Department in terms of how they release the CPI, in that you go from 0.1 to 0.2 or 0.3. They really should be like 0.15, 0.10, 0.15, 0.2, 0.25, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17
<laughs> right now. Dude, he was so convinced and compelling. Tomorrow's like, mm hmm. <laughs> Dude, what happened? The CPI missed? They rallied treasuries? The dollar sold off like crazy? And now, now Neto's leaving town. <laughs> So that FOMO that you have is that, my God, I've got to act now. What am I going to do? And you need to have some impulsion to act, some compulsion to act, to act. But you can't, so you got to read it. So I write down my FOMO scores, and I have found that when I have a FOMO really high, looking back, because I wasn't doing this at the time, I call major market turns. Like, i got to get short the S&P here. It's like the last freaking futures contract makes the ticks the lows, you know. Whoa. Or like, i got to buy here because there's no way Mark can't go higher. Hello, 2000. You know what I mean? I got caught in that, that down draft. Thank you. I'll take a bow now. Um, and so by writing that down, good to go. Create multiple contingency scenarios and plans. I journal, man. I write stuff out. I talk with a trading coach. I visualize, okay? If this number comes like this and S&P rallies to here or treasuries go here, how am I going to feel? What's the, what's the kind of empathy of the market? Denise has a test, which is called the Talent Assessment Protocol Test. It was developed by a university has been a minister for 30 years, and what they found in a lot of financial work is that people who have high levels of empathy, what's called cognitive empathy or theory of mind, do very well because they can understand how other market participants are, 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 are doing. So Denise incorporated that test and how she tests hedge funds and, and, and other people. I took the test in early March, high score in 30 years. <laughs> Seriously. So it doesn't say that, all that says is that cognitive empathy and understanding how the market's feeling and thinking is, is, is a viable skill set and truly an asset to have to incorporate on top of your technical approach that you've researched and studied. The protean approach. The word protean is named after the Greek god Proteus. Who can, it means highly versatile, easily adaptable, and able to take on many shapes and forms. Protean. He's a protean composer. He's a protean actor, a protean chef. Okay? I'm honestly surprised that no one grabbed this name before I did. Like, when I saw it, I'm like, you've got to be kidding. I didn't know what it meant when I saw it the first time. Like, protein? No. <laughs> I'm a protein trader? I've been called that a few times. I like, I like my carbs, okay? Um, so, and lastly, balance and health are the key. This business is a lot of adrenaline, which can, which can have very negative impacts on the endocrine system. We go in there, and, and I've gone through my own, my own health struggles, and trying to balance out, you know, things. I started doing more yoga, breathing. I take time away. I cut my trading back, like, to only a few hours a day now because I, I, I go after periods of price discovery. Pressure of the book in New York. I went through a lot of, a lot of serious health problems. And, in fact, that's what compelled me to donate the profits of the book to help veterans because going through my own anxiety attacks, panic attacks, really, really horrifically, I had the financial means to get myself out of it. I had the financial means to hire help to work through those things. And this is one of those like deep, dark secrets they don't talk about on New York and Wall Street, but a lot of people are taking mental health medication. A lot of people are doing things, self-medicating drugs, alcohol, and they don't have the balance in their life. And it doesn't get enough attention. It needs to get more attention. And freaking, who better than me to talk about it, right? I'll just get it out there. <laughs> so, so my dog that I have helps me deal with some of the anxiety attacks I get sometimes, which is why I said, I'm going to help veterans out there. And we sell 10,000 copies of this book, because I'll make sure we'll sell 10,000 copies of this book. We're going to have a lot of service dogs going to a lot of veterans to help them out. Next slide. Did you bring any books with you? Um, no, this book comes out in the fall. Oh, with my books. Out no, it's not out yet. No, no, no. no. Huh. I'm still editing it, actually. I've got to go back to it. That's why another reason like, I kind of did it. So I have like 300 pages still left to edit. The content's done, but now I've got to make sure it flows. Hmm. I've got 22 chapters in this thing. And imagine to come up with this, with this content, it's like some of this content took me like a week to write one and a half pages. Because when you're creating like these ideas and you're trying to articulate them at the most basic level, so the people truly, you have to walk, take people on a progression. Okay, here is why this is important. Now this is why that's important. Now here's an example. Now we're going to take this and build upon that. Okay, if you want to make a book that's both good, informative, and, and actionable, it's going to take you four and a half years. Next. <laughs> oh wait, no, no, I'm sorry. Back, back, back. Yeah. Takeaways. <laughs> Challenge conventional wisdom. Yeah. Believe you have an edge. You do. You guys have. You have the commitment. You're here tonight. You showed up. I see a lot of heads nodding, which means you get it. I like seeing that. Always look to in innovative. 
Thank you, spell check. <laughs> Acknowledge, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you are only as strong as your network of information, which is why the MTA matters, which is why making contacts matters, you know. Understand your edge. That edge is only going to help your network grow. Because if I see you have an edge, I'm going to want to learn from that edge. I'm going to, wow, he has an edge in trading the NASDAQ in the third hour of the trading day. Well, you know what? That's what he's best at. He can tell me why the healthcare sector in the third hour of the trading day for the last 50 years responds the way it does. So every day, third hour of the market, I'm going to send you an IM. Hey, dude, what do you think for the next hour? <laughs> Boom. Well, here's what I'm seeing as well. I think, you know, right now the CPI came in hot, but the market's not reacting, which tells me it's oversold. Da -da -da, look, the shorts are going to come in and cover now. They'll square away. Look for the trend to resume next week. Because I got something, I'll give something. That's how you grow your network. You got to be able to provide value. So understand that value. Next slide. I'm on Twitter. Email me. ProtonTrainer.com. Collect it too. You can follow. Don't got to pay anything. Just follow. You know. And go from there. That's what I got for you. John, will you be able to make your slides available that we can distribute? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, um, I couldn't memorize all No, no, there was, there was a lot. I was throwing a lot of... <laughs> what was that website again that you mentioned? The collective too. Oh, oh, oh yeah, um, rvmacro.com. I'm going to send everyone, unless you tell me otherwise, a two-week subscription. I'm, I'm going to roll you guys on a two-subscription of the Site Beyond Site newsletter by Neil Azus. Expect that to come in. If you don't get it in the next week, email me or email one of the MTA heads here. But that's an absolute essential part. So and even if you don't subscribe for nine bucks a day, just what you learn in two weeks off of it will like just make you say, okay, this is what I need to know, and this is where I need to at least understand that this is who I'm competing against or this is what a segment of the market is aware of. Sir? What's in Collective 2? Is it a system? Will you have it there? Or no, it's 100% discretionary trading. It, it's, discretionary. It's, it's my own discretion based on what I'm seeing in the market in real time. It's like a shadow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> as best I can. It's still limited because of the way that it's manually inputs, but, you know... I didn't know that they let you do that, because I thought it's all systematic. Yeah, it, that's what they said, but then you can still go and input stuff manually, and that's, that's, that's how I got through. And, it's and like other one, like co does it too. A striker doesn't let you do it. A striker, you need to have a, a system. Yeah. Which, which you, can, you can track it. Uh, right. You can, which upload, or it works on API into yeah, the... It's, it's yeah, it's Yeah, no, this, this lets you obviously do the API deal, but then, when does, you run, yeah. but then when you run a search for the systems that have any kind of performance, not much shows up. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a surprise. Like, right. no, first, when you mentioned Collective 2, I thought that's a useless, totally useless. Yeah. The whole site is useless. Yeah. But then, but then maybe there's a merit to what you're saying. Right. Uh, that's, in fact, if you're not in the top five, why would anybody go to anywhere else? Right. Like, I wouldn't go to 1,400, you know, rank system. Right. Right. Well, here's the thing about Collective 2, and, and I, I wish... Go, go back five, seven slides, Collective 2 thing. Let's see. Da, da, more, more, more. More, one more, two more, two more, one more, and two more, sorry. Okay, right here. What I like about Collective 2 is that you can set the parameters on the grid. So I talked about these parameters here, and I'm sorry that this is a little faded here, but the age of the system, I said at least 50 trades, um, the max drawdown, less than 30%, annual, annual return, more than 10%, the profit factor, meaning what's the wins versus loss? So Prodi right now is a 1.9 profit factor, meaning... I've made 190,000 and lost 100,000. Okay. Um, the Calmar on top of that, so I can do minimum, and I said uh, it up one percent in the last 90 days. Five showed up. So John, this is. But 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 you can at least search on that though, so it doesn't have to be the top or bottom. But you can look for right. return over max drawdown features. That's what I was trying to get at. It. Well, I just want to find something that has a good return and only this max drawdown. Right. Show me what comes up. All asset classes: stocks, futures, options, forex. So what was the max uh, drawdown, you say? 16%. But my max drawdown from the principal was 7 on this strategy. I started with 250, okay. worked with 263, was short into the March, I was short Euro dollars into the March yelling decision when she smashed the market with like her lowered FOMC estimates and lowered, I was freaking totally on the wrong side of that trade, got destroyed. Okay. So in the, in, the, in the worst year of 2015, yeah. you had it, what was the max drawdown? Uh, 8%. That's pretty good. Yeah. The worst year, you had 8%. The worst over the last five years is 8%. And in fact, when I took the 100,000, 3.2 million, 
I've never lost more than 80,000 of capital on that way up. So and I have zero, by the way, zero correlation to the S&P. Right. Zero correlation over the last five years of the S&P. And your profit factor is the five-year average, or is it the average? No, the profit factor here is, 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 is they take all the wins and all the losses. In other words, I've had like 100, and, let's see, number of trades. Yeah. I have 133 trades, and so I've won like 75 and lost 50-ish, or 56-ish or something. And the net results of that are up 190 Eight thousand down, one hundred eight thousand or something, which gives a one point nine profit factor because it's total wins and total losses. Yes. So, so the last question is: if it's not a if it's not a system, yeah. How did you measure all that? Is it by just by? No, no, they measure it. They, they, they record oh, every they trade do. and they provide the measure, which is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. You guys can input your trades; they'll do all the measuring. Awesome. Yeah. So now you can go and at least establish a business or a credibility for yourself. Say okay. I have a third-party verification system I can show somebody now that measures all the institutional metrics. This would cost you tens of thousands of dollars to have a firm come in and do that on your own trading account. This gives you a way, at least, to start a conversation. Yeah, but if, it's, if the system is automatic, then you, all these things are done in, like, trade station or uh, right. Ninja. Or right, system right, system. But right. But if it's not, then this is great. This is great. Yeah. For 120 bucks for six months. And, and, and they still have a ways they can improve. I'm not trying to sell this as any kind of panacea. But this is a start. And this is, to me, symbolic. And encapsulates what 2015 is about, the decade of data. Okay? And let me tell you something about this. I'm going to give you guys a fact. This is the first chapter of my book. You'll read it when it comes out. I'm going to email it to you. Part of the thing that we're not aware of, but you really got to be aware of, is I'm going to tell you the three biggest times of a 50-50 portfolio of stocks and bonds and the, and the best sharp ratios. What I mean by that is, if I had a portfolio that was made up of 50% stocks and 50% bonds, I'll tell you the period of the best five-year sharp ratio in history, okay? 82 to 86, 19 to 96, that portfolio had a combined sharp ratio of 1.2, okay? 90, 95 to 99, if I own 50% stocks and 50% bonds, that portfolio had a sharp ratio of 1.4. 2003 to 2007, 50% stocks, 50% bonds, that sharp ratio of 1.8. 2010 to 2014, the sharp ratio of 6. So you talk about complacency in, in, in markets, okay? We have never been through a five-year period where the ultimate risk parity trade, and I can explain that after the class if you want me to explain what that means, of long equities, long bonds has been so prosperous. But who can tell me what happened in 1987? Who can tell me what happened in the year 2000? Mm -hmm. And who can tell me what happened in the year 2008? Periods followed by balanced portfolio outperformance on a risk-adjusted basis have resulted in outsized volatility following that next year. So buckle up your seatbelts. 2016. 2015. This year. You think this year? 2010 to 2014 had a sharp ratio of 6. Now... Will it manifest itself? I don't know. But all of those crashes in 87, in 2000, 2000 was April, but still the real crash from 2000 happened in the, in the Q4 of 2000. And 2008, Q4 as well. We had earlier signs in 2008, the Lehman, the, the, the Bear Stearns deal and fiasco in March, but the market still kind of wrecks it on. But the commodities broke down much earlier than that. And what are commodities doing right now? Copper. China comes up with, with, with provisions to make things better, and copper's making new lows. Don't walk, run. <laughs> because copper and gold and palladium should not be making new lows if China's put liquidity back into the market again. Okay? And so now we have this, I mean, people talk about the VIX complacency. The VIX is a bullshit measure for complacency. It's there. I appreciate it. I've showed it earlier. But you show me a portfolio, a structural, systemic portfolio trend like that, and that's what precipitates massive asymmetrical downside moves. Questions? You. You. You, you, you in the back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh. um, do you use much sentiment data? You know, robo, logo, things like that. Margin, cash, no. available. No. It doesn't mean, like, I'll read someone who does and say, cool. But again, I don't, I think there's many ways to skin the cat. I'm not here saying this works or that works. This is just what's worked for me to generate these returns. Futures, 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 futures are, are 
Anybody here trade futures? Yeah. Okay, that's the dark side, baby. You know what I mean? Once you start trading futures, <laughs> it's the pure market, best tax situation, overnight liquidity, no uptick rule, no SEC to deal with, okay? Like the safety sees their own, has their own issues, but it's just a very pure market. Yeah, I agree. And it's I very, agree. it's just pure. I agree. And, um, and liquid. Yeah, are, you, are you strictly a day trader or do you hold... I'm 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 a short term high velocity. I'm sorry. Oh wait a minute. Are, are you strictly yeah. high velocity? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Cross asset. Cross right. Trader, yes. Or do you do you sometimes go to the dark side and hold? No, that, that, but okay. But here's the thing, though. If you have a smaller balance sheet, should you be engaging in strategies with lower sharp ratios and more volatility? I ask that rhetorically, of course. The answer is no. So if you if you have, if, if flexibility is your single biggest asset because you're not managing a big book, why would you then adopt strategies that are of a big book? You should be hired, if you, if you have the ability to not face liquidity, constraint, liquidity constraints, you should be more active in the markets, assuming you have an edge. Because you can sell the one and two and three lots, okay? Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Institution, because you can only buy 200 contracts at a time. You can only buy 50,000 shares at a time. Well, you know, I mean, you're the one getting a salary, too. So I got I to earn my keep the hard way, you know, which is how I pay all my bills. From 2011, every dollar I make to pay my rent comes from my trading P&O. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a futures guy, and, and I trade, like I say, between, like, two minutes to, like, Maybe a day, but most of the time it's been like two minutes and two hours. There's enough liquidity and velocity in that time frame. That, that's and given, the time frame I yeah, too. Yeah. In the indexes or? Yeah, all indexes. Metals, so and metals energy, all ags, big economic events. Because the reality is that if there's, if there's a number that hits the market, the guy that runs $200 million or $340 million who's stuck, he can't get out. The market cannot reprice immediately. He's effing stuck. And I want to kick him. I want to be part of the problem, not part of the solution, okay? <laughs> Dude, I feel your pain, brother, but this, this game is ruthless, you know what I mean? We eat our young here in this game, y'all. We eat our young. <laughs> Did you say you were going to email us your slides? Since yeah. Well, yeah. If you can yeah. email them to either Money to Brown and then... Yeah, and I promise I'll fix the, uh, the, uh, the, the inno of the presentation. <laughs> Any comment on the currency uh, futures versus the forex market? No, um, I'm a currency futures guy. You know, it's it's directionally you're still facing you know the issues that you are. I would say like everything, the more outs the better. Um, there's 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 more options on on the cash forex stuff. This the CME, the IMM currency futures don't have your crosses like you have to create them synthetically in there. So if I want to trade euro yen, it's better to just create, you know, go short one year or go long one yen to create that spread synthetically, whereas the cash guys have, like, the Mexican, the Mexican Euro Mex, you know. Right. Like, in some of those non-traditional crosses, or not non-traditional, but not as prevalent crosses, are better from a cash account as opposed to trading the futures on them. It's still light outside. That'd be pretty, pretty efficient, you know. <laughs> What's your view on uh, the precious metal? Trouble, big trouble. Be short and sell bounces. Um, it's in big, it's in big trouble. Gold, I think 1030 right now as part of this reprice. Remember, we're talking about incredible consolidation in the metal markets, and so there's a lot of like vigor built up in that bad boy. And when it reconciles itself, it can be pretty nasty. Especially, you know, like like, like where's your risk room right now? The Iran deal, okay. Greece is out of the way. China's done what it's going to do. You know, inflation concerns, the Fed now, at least there's a perception looking at the euro dollar curve. I mean, they're raising, which is enough. Stronger dollar, it's an awfully tough environment for silver and gold to thrive in. And one thing that's of interest is like the gold palladium spread. I do a lot of relative value stuff. The gold palladium spread traded below a friggin' two standard deviation move, you know, on the downside. So, I mean, that's a friggin' message. And, and euro's making lows while that's happening. You have a chance now, net or number dashboard, now you're selling balances, you're offering into these moves. It's powerful stuff. You can't do it. <laughs> what about, you know, Greece first had the big uh, blow up in 2010. Yeah. And gold doubled. So 
this time, Reese comes back, it's yeah. even bigger in the headlines, yeah. Cole does nothing. So what does that tell you? That tells you something right there. Right? So what does that tell you? Let's play a little, let's play a little more Socratic. And I'll, what, 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 what does that mean to you as an observer? What factors are different from 2010 to now? It, it told us that Reese was no concern with Mark. Let's dig deeper. I want to challenge you more than that. Okay, yeah. okay, so what was the monetary environment like in 2010 versus today? Was the Fed looking to raise rates in 2010? No. Okay. okay. So then what does that tell you then about what the market's worried about? The, the market is focused on rate hikes. Yeah. Sir? Yeah, to that point, do you uh, expect more from the QE? I mean, QE is, is a metaphor, right? right? For like, you know, more accommodation, non, -com non traditional measures of accommodation. That's what QE is, you know? And so, would I rule it out? No. I mean, this is, Yellen is a dove. She's a labor market dove. And what are we not seeing in the labor market now? We're not seeing wage pressures. To me, the most brutal part of the last non farm payroll number, and we'll see, we have the employment cost index coming out next week. I think it's, yeah, I think it's next week. That was a, comes out quarterly, something people pay a lot of attention to, but without wage and pressures, QE4 can come in the way of just simply having the terminal fed funds rate not go to 3.5 like they're projecting right now, but simply go to 2 or 1.3. There's your QE. QE4, all you people, five-year treasuries, I think the terminal fed fund, and when I say terminal fed funds rate, I mean at what point in time will the Fed stop raising rates? Right now, if you look at their projections, 3.5% is the terminal rate, meaning the finishing rate which they're going to stop, okay? So QE4 can come in the way of I don't think the yield curve is going to get that steep. I think maybe we'll raise it 25 basis points in October, which my call is October. It's not December. Because the, the excess reserves and all the machinations that have to go on need to happen in October. September, she's too dovish on. If we don't get you know, really extreme, if we don't see a pickup in average hourly earnings in the, in the non-farm payrolls report in two weeks from now, I think it happens in October. And the Fed has shown precedent for not having to have you know, necessarily a press conference. I think this first rate hike... Or they can even announce a press conference in October. Because for those of you who are not aware, the press conference for the Fed only happens on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. So the October would not have a press conference in that regard. But to your extent, QE4 may come in the, rate in, the, in the form of a lower terminal Fed funds rate, which is non-traditional combination. Fucking terminal Fed funds, sorry, at 1.75, that's your terminal <laughs> Fed funds? That's QE4 to me. Next question. Um, yes? Do you see oil going lower since there's such a huge glut? Well, if I see the, the dollar going stronger, if I see the RAND deal that just came out happen, mm -hmm. we see, you know, contango in the curve there, 45, 44, why not? I mean, that's, that, that's a classic trend-following market right there. What's the trend in oil? There's your, you know, your golden cross, cool, sell it. Um, I think it can go a lot lower than most people think. Yeah. Markets tend to do that. So what's the CPI number going to do to the market tomorrow, you think? Smash it if it's hot. Um, smash treasuries, smash the euro. So you're, what is it? Because I trade the, the futures. It's EW, what's the euro ETF? EWE, EW, what is it? FFC. FF, thank you. Yeah. Um, so watch that in the pre market. Um, it could be in a lot of trouble. Watch commodity currencies. Watch, I'd say probably watch high yields, HYG. Keep an eye on that tomorrow as well. Yeah. How long do you think euro is going to go? Parity. September. Let's start parity. Well, by September. By September, we'll test the lows of 104. But to me, we break that, we accelerate to parity. Um, it's just one of those markets that, and then that becomes, and then and at that point in time, now this is where it gets interesting. Because if the euro gets back to 104, now the stronger dollar becomes a headwind. I mean, manufacturing still really struggled this year. And so what's interesting to me is that Wells Fargo, um, had an earnings call, and this is a point that Neil made in his newsletter. I would never know this because I don't listen to all the earnings calls. Again, who can aggregate, organize, and assimilate? Wherever you macro, I go to one or just a couple of sources, boom. But Wells Fargo is something very interesting. This is something that we'll keep an eye on for the financial sector within the S&P 500. It's a huge sector. One of the ten that is, has the spiders, ten or nine or ten. They opted to move from floating to fixed debt, okay, which means most banks are known that if a yield curve begins to steepen, their profits begin to go up commensurately. Okay, steepening yield curve, you know, they, they, they borrow short, they lend long. Okay, that's the same in, in the banking side. Well, they have structured their liabilities to the point that 
Wells Fargo, and we may see this trend from other financials, is now not going to benefit from a steepening yield curve, which is them expressing their viewpoint on where they think the terminal Fed fund rate is going to be. So where most people expect the financials to rally with a steepening yield curve, this dynamic may not be in play now. So again, understand the macro. I would have never known that had Neil not pointed that out in yesterday's newsletter because of how they've restructured their fixed versus floating liabilities. On a floating basis, in terms of their liabilities, as rates rise, that book becomes more profitable. But with fixed liabilities, it's a much different dynamic. So keep that in mind as we go out there. Yeah, he's doing it with, like Jesse Livermore used to do. That. He used to look for those little nuggets of yeah. information that wasn't anywhere else. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and that's the rare view, you know. Of, yeah. Yeah. Any more?